Turning your Bibles to Ezekiel 38. You know, we're talking a lot about biblical prophecy and end time stuff lately. I just want to give you some basic, very basic understanding as to what we're talking about with regards to Syria, with regards to Russia, all the countries surrounding Israel, why they're so significant, where in Scripture it comes from, and so that at least you have a basic understanding as to why this is so important. When you get to the chapters of Ezekiel chapter 37 and 38, they are prophecies specifically concerning the last days. In chapter, how do I know that? Chapter 37 is a direct prophecy about Israel once again becoming a nation and having their land back again. Dry bones as though they were dead coming back to life. God putting flesh on their bones, breathing life into their bodies, so on and so forth. They were, dis they were the dispersia, they were dispersed, and then now they've been brought back. Something people thought was never possibly going to happen ever again. That once the people have been dispersed from their land, it's never before happened in all human history where they've ever been identified even as a people ever again. But no, not Israel. They've remained pure and separate from, the, from commingling with the rest of the world. They didn't do that. God did that. God kept them separate whether it was through hatred from other nature, nations where they dwelt, people who would refuse to intermingle with them, or whether it was their conviction to stay separate from other people and commingling, they have remained separate as a, as a people. No other peoples have done that. They are a miracle. There's a reason why they still exist, not just as a nation, as a people, because God has called them to be so. He's not done with them. Don't believe the theology, the people out there that say that God's done with Israel. He's not done with them. In the last days, he's going to bring them to himself during the time of the tribulation. So that's chapter 37. I'm more interested in chapter 38. And if you want a more detailed teaching on these things, you can go into the archives on our messages and look up. Our, I did a, an entire um, teaching through the entire book of Ezekiel. You can go back and listen to that. But in chapter 38, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshesh, Tubal, and prophesy against them. You're scratching your head going, so what does that mean? Well, Magog was the second son of Japheth. If you remember who Noah was, the, the dude with the boat, remember? He had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth. You can read all about them in the book of Genesis. Those are the three sons of Noah. Now, if, you, if you've ever heard of the table of nations in Bible classes or whatever, and, and how different races of people came to be separate or, or of, you know, look different and all those things, that's because these three men after the flood went to different places on the known world at, at the time, and their, they and their descendants became different groups of people. Now the people that came to dwell in the north were the descendants of Japheth. And, he, and Japheth went up to the north and he and his descendants, the second son of Japheth was Magog. And then if you look a little further, and by the way, the, 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 re, the region or the area where Magog came to dwell is modern day Russia. Okay, this is why we believe that Gog is a reference to Russia. That's why. And then if you go a little further and you see, you see uh, Meshesh and Tubal, that's the sixth and the fifth. Tubal being the fifth, Meshesh being the sixth sons of Japheth. And so these men are also mentioned in here, right? And wherever regions or areas they've dwelt. And you'll see a bunch more names. As, in fact, if you read a little further with me. And say thus, says the Lord. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks into your jaws, and lead you out with all your army horses, horsemen, <coughs> all splendidly clothed and, and, and in a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, Libya are all with them, all of them going out with Shields and helmets, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togarma, to, uh, sorry, to, Togarma, 
from, far, from the far north and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourselves and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about, and prepare yourselves. Now, so you're thinking to yourself, okay, so, so that's a prophecy about Russia, but what specifically are they going to do? Let me see here. Let's move a little bit further down. Go to verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, on that day my people Israel will dwell as they're dwelling safely, then you'll know it. Uh, then you will come from your place out of the far north, again, we know where Russia is, right? You and many peoples with you, all of them riding horses, great company, great mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land, and it will be in the latter days that I will bring you out against my land. So that, the, so that all the nations may know me. This is the purpose that God has in doing this, is that he would be set apart uh, among all the gods of all people's minds and imaginations of all the world, that the, the true God, the God of Israel, would be known before everyone, right? That's his purpose for all things. And then verse 17, Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in the former days, my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. Now, this is where verse 18 starts to turn about how he's going to judge Gog. He's against Gog because Gog has refused to believe and submit to the God of Israel. And it will come to pass on that, at that same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. God's fury will show in his face. He will be angry and it will be being poured out. This, what is it? What period of time that we know of, es eschatologically speaking, uh, end times wise? What does this sound like to you? Revelation? Is that what somebody just said? It sounds like Revelation, doesn't it? That's what this is. This is during the time of the tribulation that, that these things are happening. Russia is going to come down. And you're thinking to yourself, Wow, Russia's in the news right now. And you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, that's great. What about Syria? Well, turn to Isaiah now. Isaiah 17. You'll see Isaiah 17, verse 1, begins with a burden against Damascus. Where's Damascus? Syria. Is it an insignificant little town somewhere in the middle of Syria? No. It's their capital. The burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city. Hasn't happened yet, has it? And it will be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aor will be forsaken. They will be for flocks which lie down, and no one will make them uh, no one will make them afraid. The fortress also will cease from Ephraim, the kingdom of Damascus. Now you're talking a broader area, and the remnant of Syria. They will be as the glory of the children of Israel, says the Lord of hosts. God is going to completely wipe that entire regime off the face of the planet. They're going to be done. They're going to be powerless. And it's so, it's so interesting. You have these, these, this unfulfilled prophecy in Isaiah chapter 17. You have you know, this unfulfilled prophecy in Ezekiel chapter 38 about Russia. Hear about Syria. And right now in our news, we have those two people featured primarily against us, against its own people, and very definitely a long-standing history against Israel. Israel's a problem to them. And you see these verses there in, in Ezekiel 38 about Russia coming to the realization that they're, they're, they have a hatred toward a people who dwell peacefully in their land. How could that be? You know, one of, one of the um, updates I posted from Behold Israel, you know, that uh, uh, Facebook page that, and also a website and also an app for your phones, Behold Israel. Our friend, Amir, uh, not my personal friend, but a friend of Calvary Chapel. He works very closely with a lot of Calvary Chapels, especially Jack Hibbs. He's always doing updates with Jack Hibbs from Calvary Chapel out there in, in California by Los Angeles. And um, he said recently that, that um, Israel is now fully operational with their Iron Dome. Three different systems are now in place that missiles cannot attack uh, Israel. 
Nobody, you, you huck a missile at Israel, like a, a, you know, a major you know, a missile, of, you know, anything that's like an ICBM, any, any big kind of missiles, they're going to shoot it right out of the air. No problem. Is people, life continues in Israel. Why? Well, because God has made it so that even in the midst of, of you know, when everybody hates them, and, and by the way, we, we looked at Ezekiel 38, you saw all those other nations that I, I didn't bother to define who they were, and you think to yourself, well, how could there be a period of time when all the nations around Israel all have gone through such an overwhelming change that they're now like, you know, violent and they're all wanting to kill Israel? Well, that's what we call the Arab Spring and the Arab Winter, which we've, we've recently gone through. Something that no, no, histor- no one ever predicted, no, no student of humanity ever predicted that all those nations in such a short, less than a year, would be com- their governments completely overturned and, more, and, and the more the new governments take over, the more radical they become. How, how could that happen all of a sudden, you know? How can we not sit back and think to ourselves, we're living in the last days. Turn to uh, Matthew 24. The disciples were there with Jesus and they left the temple, went across the Kidron Valley to the to the, uh, to, to the Mount of Olives, across the little valley there up into the, to the uh, garden where the olive go- grove was. And as was, as was something they typically would do, they're, they're all sitting there and fellowshipping together. And, and the, um, Jesus predicted for them that the temple would one day soon not be in existence anymore. Now, they, they, they couldn't even imagine that. He's telling them something very radical. The temple's not going to be there. It's, it's, at this point, it had been there almost a thousand years. Their faith, the, the, the faith of Israel, was, was not in God alone. In fact, it probably was more in the temple and in temple worship. They thought their temple worship was more worship of God. It, they, they would say, no, no, no. It was more worship of the, of the system that existed at the temple. You know that, you see that clearly as Jesus overturned money tables and as he said, my house shall be a house of prayer. As he, the temp, temple worship was not about God anymore. It was about the temple. It was about themselves. It was about their system. And so Jesus says in verse 2, do you not see all things? Remember, there are these guys, in my imagination, they're, they're gazing back across the valley at the te- east wall of the temple going, wow, that's where we're going to rule and reign from. You know, that's where we're, we're going to set up the kingdom now. And man, this is, everyone's going to bow to us. Jesus is going to bring all the other nations to our feet. And they're going to worship at Jesus' feet. And we're going to be Jesus' right-hand men, you know? That's my imagination of what they're thinking. Jesus says, do you not see all these things? That first phrase becomes a key to understanding everything. It's about seeing it's about understanding. It's about observing the signs and the things around you. It's about knowing what the Bible says about what the days you live in and understanding that. And so he says, Do you not see that? Oh, surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left there upon another. Some of these stones were a couple thousand pounds each. This wasn't a, this wasn't a, a, a trite thing <laughs> to say. You didn't have equipment. You didn't have cranes. For one stone not to be left upon another was a pretty big prediction for Jesus. Not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Immediately they understand Jesus is talking big picture here. They get it. How do I know that? Look at verse 3. As he sat there on the, on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, just four of them, saying, tell us what, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Three very specific questions based on what Jesus just said in front of all the disciples. Four of them pull them aside and say, wait a minute. When will these things be, the, the stones being cast one from, from upon another, the temple being torn down? What will be the sign of your coming? Because he kept telling them he was going to come again to, to rule and reign on the earth, reference to the millennial reign. And what will be the end of the age? They know that, that life as they knew it could not continue. They knew that. They got that much from the Old Testament. At that point, they understood those things. They were asking those three questions. So everything that you then see Jesus say from throughout the rest of what we call the Olivet Discourse is an answer to those three questions. So let's take a look. He says, take heed that no one deceives you. 
Well, we've also seen throughout the rest of the New Testament, Paul warning about people coming in with false doctrines and fables and all these things. Give no heed to these things. Take heed that no one deceives you. The only way I know to not be deceived is, is, to, is to intently study the truth. The more you're in the truth, the more you will not be deceived, right? For many will come in my name saying I am the Messiah, and they'll deceive many, which has happened for many years, and you will hear of, now this sounds like today, if, it, if it's never sounded, if the world has never sounded like this, I don't know what, when it will. Wars and rumors of wars. Wars, there's wars going on, and there's rumors of potential more wars, right? We have North Korea, we have, you know, all this stuff going on. Um, and, and he goes, he wars, rumors, wars, see that you are not troubled. Another important thing, listen, what do you think about the missiles and, and bombing Syria? You have to do what's right no matter what the consequences may be. Do what's right and trust God with the consequences. What we did was the right thing. But what if it, then this happens? That's not my responsibility. I have to do the right thing. Now, you might have mixed feelings about that. I know a lot of Christians do about whether or not we should have bombed that base, that, that airfield. It was the right thing to do. If it slows or stops the torture of people, that's, that's not just war. That was torturing people. That's, the, that's why it was a line that should not be crossed. It's one thing for a civil war to break out in another country to, and two sides to fight against. Okay, you know, let them fight it out. And I get that. But when people are torturing people, that's, that's unacceptable. It's just, we, you, 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 you're then responsible to God to do something. That's my conviction. Okay, so, so for us, don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Who decided that Donald Trump should be in the White House today? Are you sure? I am. Not because Donald Trump's a great guy. Nobody's a great guy. Jesus is the only great guy. I don't have faith in Donald Trump. I just know that God put him there. That's all I know. He happens to fall you know, more on the side of some things that I believe than the previous administration or the one that would have won. And so I'm happy. There's a little bit of rejoicing over those things, that some things are going to get defended that I think are biblical. But we're going to probably be in war soon. Probably. Why would I say that? The scriptures seem to say that there's going to be war, right? Now listen, keep, keep going with me here. We're to not be troubled. We're to not be troubled. Don't, don't let yourself, don't let emotions take you over if something happens and you're like, this is Donald Trump's fault. Don't just, listen, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your eyes on the Lord. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places, places, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Some translations read, beginning of sorrows says birth pangs. Birth pangs. What do we know, ladies, about birth pangs? Well, when you, <laughs> I see some smirks and some nods. Well, they start out bad, and every once in a while, and they get worse, and they happen constantly, right? So it starts out, oh, things look bad. And then the things get bad and they get closer together, right? Birth, birth pains. That's what he's talking. That's exactly the phraseology. That's what he means in the original language. So literally, wars, rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquakes, all these things are going to be going on. They've been going on and on, on the rise for many years. The earth is not even settled. You realize when earthquakes, all this stuff, the earth isn't happy anymore. Nothing's right. There's no peace in the earth itself and in, in people. And, and, uh, but and these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up for tribulation and kill you, and you'll be hated for, for my sake, he says elsewhere, or, or at the end of the verse. He says, for, you'll be hated by all nations for my name, name's sake. Now, this has literal fulfillment throughout Christianity, but it also has a fulfillment in this present age and in the one that this is speaking of, which I believe is also this present age, in that we are more and more rising in people's hearts and minds as the problem because of what we believe and what we stand for. We are holding back the agenda of a very liberally minded world. 
The UN, the reason why the UN has done nothing for years to stop Assad from torturing hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of people is because there's an overwhelming majority of very liberally minded anti-Israel people that are not willing to do anything because they, are, they listen, they get the whole, the uh, Islamic tribalistic wars and they get that. They're okay with that. They're okay with it. We're not because it doesn't make any sense to us. So look what it says in verse 10 now. Then there will be, then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Disunity. Disunity. We're completely disunified more than we've ever been, even as a nation. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. All these things, now he's taught, when he talks about the end, that's answering one third of the question. So don't sit there and try to figure out, well, which, which verse did the tribulation start or whatever. You, don't try to do that. He's, listen, one, understand one thing. In the Olivet Discourse, Jesus is not talking about the church. He's not trying to, he's not, there's nowhere in here where you can say, oh, this is where the church is gone. It's just not in there. That's just not the point. It's not in the questions. Nowhere in the questions is that one of the questions. He's not even answering where the church is taken from the earth. And some people go, well, look at verse 25 or chapter 25. And and it talks about the, um, there's one working at the mill and and one's taken in the other, one working in the field and one's taken in the other not and so on and so forth. There in in the first section, I think it is. Um, of chapter 25. I don't personally see that as the rapture. I think that that's at the end of the tribulation or the end of the millennial reign. Either of those two are what what that's talking about. Um, But going back to chapter 24, look at verse 36. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, it's funny, we began tonight talking about Noah. We're kind of finishing with Noah's still part of the story here. For as the days were before the flood, just as it was in in the days of Noah, um, it will be uh, uh, the the coming of the Son of Man. It'll be the same. And for as it was in, in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. It's not that they weren't warned, was it? They did not know, knowing they didn't know, seeing they didn't see, hearing they didn't hear. That's what what this literally is saying. Um, And then this is the section. Actually, this is where I was talking about, not not chapter 25, right here is where we're going to read it in a second. Uh, Verse 40, two men will be in the field, one taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if... The master of the house had known what hour the thief would come that he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also, look at this right here very carefully, be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So, and then just a little bit before that, he says here, be ready, correct? The parable of the fig tree, verse 32. Learn this parable from the fig tree. When the branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the door. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Over and over and over again, throughout this chapter, Jesus is saying to them that you should be able to see or understand or know when you're living in the last days. You should be able to discern the signs of the times without Without question. He starts out by saying, do you not see all these things, didn't he? And then he talks about what you will see at the last days. We're living in the last days. My conviction, very very candidly, we're living in the last days. And we should not be troubled. And we should be able to discern and know. We should be able to clearly look around and see just by the verses we read in Ezekiel, just by the verses we read in Isaiah, just by these things that Jesus said. It should, it should be pretty clear to us. It, it, it should be pretty obvious. Now, what, but we don't know the day or the hour. Jesus said that too 
It's not for us to know that. I don't think it would be healthy or good for us to know that. I think really abiding in Christ today is the call of the day. 